To get rid of those pesky ads, request stories, listen to unlisted and bonus episodes, and to chat with the gang, support us by clicking the description link. Welcome to the Talk Murder Me podcast. My name is John. I'm sitting here with Jen and Nicole. Tonight, I got a crazy episode. We're going to London tonight. London town. If you like this, check out our sister podcast, Among the Dirt and Trees. Brianne, our friend in Colorado, hosts that. I produce it. She's killing it right now. It's an excellent podcast. But we do have a surprise shot. For Derek, we're going to make sure we hit the folks on the list. So Derek is next. I did not see a specific request. So so this is going to be... I picked one out for you, Derek. Do we have any more liquor from the bag? Um, There were only two. Mm, Not enough. So, but I have one other nip, so we could could do a a shot roulette, technically. Eh, Let me see them nips. No. (laughs) Why why is everyone against... Surprise shots. Surprise shot. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. Why is everyone against me today? We're not against you. <laughs> All right. This one's for you, Derek. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Derek. Oh, safe bet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Malibu. Uh, it tastes like chlorine water, like pool water. All right. I guess we can get it on. Get it on. We could definitely finish this today. I like that one. We're all about finishing bottles. Um, Tonight we're going to London. Uh, Alex, are you on here? Or who or else? Lauren. Lauren, uh, tell me, do you or know? Darren. Oh, Darren's probably Lauren's not on here. here. Lauren, do you know where Richmond is in London? Because this is where we're going to tonight. So this is, uh, look at this river that's kind of. So we're going to Two Park Road. This is in Richmond. Tupac? Richmond, London. We're going to Two Park Road. If you're saying it with a British accent. And this is actually, Lauren, have you heard this story before? I will tell you, it includes special guest Sir David Attenborough. <gasps> <laughs> David Edinburgh. <laughs> Which uh, I interviewed. No, I didn't. <laughs> I Say, wow, that is prestigious. How much did we have to pay for you to talk to him? Uh, nothing. Well, I he mean, said, Prince it, Philip died last year and he was the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, basically. David Edinburgh is the guy that does all the nature documentaries. Oh. Yeah, you didn't. Oh. I don't watch nature documentaries, okay? Basically. So I did interview him. Yeah. It's very short. Uh, he basically says, how did you get this number? <laughs> and that's all. <laughs> Oh, Attenborough. <laughs> Attenborough. David Attenborough. You don't know who that is? No. He's got the famous narration voice. So does Morgan Freeman. Oh, oh. my titties. Are you fucking... <laughs> are you comparing the god of narration to Morgan fucking Freeman? Who Morgan Freeman also played is god. god. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, Bruce Almighty, duh. We're actually starting tonight, and I showed you where we're going. There was a stunning, stunning estate at Two Vine Park Road, and it's now called Mayfield. These are the Mayfield Cottages now. So if you see them now, these are the Mayfield Cottages, but at the time they were called the Vine Cottages. So, I mean, it's interesting that they're called cottages. In, in America, they are not, a, they are called a, mansions here. No, in America, I think if you scroll to the right, you scroll to the right, they look more like townhomes. Is it multi, multi-family residence? Is, also, um, do I have the consent of our British listeners to use my accent tonight? I need your consent before I use it um where's lauren hang on Uh, alex is on too oh good alex do you know where this is do you know who lives here alex the one famous lives here in this one is right. it um what? shimmer sh- shimmer mirror Shim- shimmer mirror? what are you high or drunk i'm that trying to like, read what they're saying was that george michael's residence all right i'm gonna start the story <laughs> lauren said you can but i may spit my drink out in a good way or a bad way all right guys i'm gonna start the story where i wrote in my notes start story here <laughs> so it's so, <laughs> a good place to start, yeah. <laughs> All right, tonight we're going to Tuesday, March 4th, 1879. This is the evening time. We're in Hammersmith. There's a lovely estate of one Henry Porter, his wife, Ann Porter, and their son, Robert Porter, 15 years old. They hear a knock at the door. This is dinner time. Well, actually, it's right after dinner time. It's tea time. The Porters open the door and they see a familiar face. At least Ann does. Ann sees her old roommate, six years years ago they roomed together but this is kate webster oh my god kate her name is Catherine, but Catherine. Catherine. her name is Catherine, but everyone calls her kate oh my god kate i haven't seen you in so long come on in we can we can pillow fight and talk about our boobs and rub them together i am drunk <laughs> <laughs> 
This has turned from facts to John's fantasies. <laughs> Kate, oh my God, I haven't seen you forever. Come on in, have some tea with us. She entered and Kate Webster was tall, black haired, wearing a very expensive dress, a very stylish dress, lavish jewelry, but... Hey, what what has happened to you? Six years ago, you were poor. You know, we, we were sometimes living on the street. What happened? She got married. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. She said, I left Hammersmith six years ago and I met a man. He is twice my age. And although he doesn't get fully erect, he has a lot of money. Sugar daddy. And not only that, he lives in a stunning, stunning estate. He owns two vine cottages in Richmond. Kate Webster says, my husband, he is a bit older, but he owns a beautiful estate. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's two vine cottage. Now it's called Mayfield Cottage, but this is two park road. This is the cottage right here. They call it a cottage. What you're looking at is if... I mean, I mean, it's a mansion. That is to some me. cottage. I'd love to live in a cottage like that. But three years ago, is it? That, or, is excuse a, me. that is a house. That is not a cottage. That is a mansion. Six years ago, a manor. Six years ago, she was poor. She was doing maid services. She was trying to be a maid. Before we get any further, because there's another episode I'm researching for Darren. Okay. Finally. And it talks about. The Irish. Oh, don't you talk about my people. But so Kate Webster is Irish. Understand? Mm -hmm. And she's a maid. She or was she, a maid. She was a maid before she married. Like Bridget. Yeah, but listen. So it's very important to understand that in Ireland in 18, in the 1850s, and this is very important for any future stories. In the 1850s in Ireland, there was a huge famine. Yeah. The potato, potato famine. famine. Exactly. That's when they came to America. There you go. So and a lot know. of Boston settlers. Correct. So like my ancestors. A lot of a lot of immigrants were obviously Irish but the thing about it in Ireland they were starving to death so they moved here and they're the lowest rung of society so well, that's where all the maids come Irish in. need not apply yeah exactly that's where all the maids come in so Kate Webster obviously being once a maid but she married a very successful businessman now she comes in once a roommate who could not even pay rent was out on the street now she comes in and sees her friend Ann Porter looking like a princess of a country beautiful elegant dress expensive jewelry lavish jewelry I met this man six years ago when I left Hammersmith his name is James Thomas and he has a stunning estate and ever since then I've been a woman of luxury hmm. Kate Webster then tells Anne quote then last month my husband died and now I am all alone. My parents in Scotland want me to come and be with them. Before I go, however, I'd like to sell my furniture to some reliable dealer. So, a new widow. Mm. She married an older man. He passed away. The estate is filled with luxury furniture, antique furniture, very expensive oak and marmalade furniture. Um, I don't think that's the right term, but okay. <laughs> Lady Marmalade? She wants to sell this stuff. Voulez vous coucher avec moi, c'est soir. She pause. Voulez vous coucher avec moi. That means will you go to bed with me? I did know that. She then says, a woman is so helpless in such matters, it really takes a man to handle a business transaction. That the goddamn truth. I'm, I wouldn't be shocked if John only covered stories from the 1800s from now on, just to get a little sense of his masculinity back. Y'all didn't raise your hand, so I didn't listen. Sorry. She told the Porter family that if she could sell these this furniture, if they could help her sell this furniture, then she would bequeath them two antique chairs from the lot. Now, these chairs are very expensive. So Henry Porter tells his son Robert, a 15-year-old, to help Kate carry her bags to the railroad station after tea and so she can get on a train to Richmond. They do discuss... Who that who could actually buy this furniture? And Anne says, I'll be in touch. I do know someone named John Church. He's a pub owner, and I believe he will take the furniture. So after that discussion, she gets back on the train. The Porter men go with her to the train to accompany her back to her own estate from Hammersmith. They arrive an hour early, and they decide to wait in this pub. Now, this pub is called Oxford and Cambridge Arms. It is at the end of Hammersmith Bridge and right by the River Thames. They all have drinks. 
So at this point, you guys understand what's going on. She shows up at the Porter's, Ann Porter, her old roommate, and says, I have come into all this wealth. My husband died. I have all this furniture. If you can help me sell it, then I will give you two antique chairs. They say, yes, we can definitely help you with that. I think I know someone, a pub owner, and we'll be in touch. Then Kate Webster leaves. She gets on a train, but since it was dark outside, she didn't want to go alone. So the, the two Porter men father and son accompany her to the train track they get there an hour early they decide that instead of waiting at the train station for an hour for a train let's go have a few drinks they go to the oxford and cambridge arms pub at the end of hammersmith bridge and then they start drinking sounds good to me they have one round of drinks and then kate out of nowhere says quote I have to meet a man nearby and and give him this bag. I'll be right back. Now, with Kate Webster was a bag, a, a black bag. And no one, I mean, no one knows what was in it. Body parts. But she had this bag. Was it smelly? And she was taking it with her. Was it heavy? All of a sudden, in the pub, she says, hold on a second. I got to go and I got to drop this bag off. Was it on wheels? So she returns 20 minutes later. Now, the son, the Henry Porter's son, Robert, actually goes, this 15-year-old son, accompanies her, Kate Webster, back to her estate where you saw the, uh, on Vine, or on Park, Park Road, right? And and because she has some stuff that she needs Tupac to move. Road. She has some stuff that she needs to move. The next day, Robert comes back to Hammersmith and says that she just helped Kate move some things. The next day, the porters contact their friend. And this friend's name is John Church. He's an owner of a pub. And he's also he he also deals in antiquities and old old and kind of furniture. Jen stop playing with my dog. He deals in this old furniture. He resells it and he makes money like that too. So John Church, now this is the next day. John Church, this man shows up at Kate Webster's house and he appraises this furniture. He's looking through all this furniture and he, it takes actually four days, but the the first day he was there, there was a newsboy outside that threw a, a paper at the door. The lead story of that paper was a headless body that was found in a chest, a big old trunk chest, was found just below the bridge of the River Thames. That was the headline story. Mm. According to Dr. Thomas Bond, it was a woman between 50 and 60 years of age, 5'2 in height, weighing about 135 pounds and dead six or seven days. They read the paper, kind of laughed about it, talked about it, and then John Church went back to his appraisals of the furniture. You guys Okay, you guys staying with me? Mm -hmm. Trying to, yeah. The cops in that article said that it would be very difficult to identify this body because, I mean, this was the 1800s. And the the only way that they can identify it is by the suitcase itself, which was elegant. It was expensive and it was made of this heavy construction. So it was very well made, handmade. And it was obviously of a wealthy person would mm. have a suitcase like this. All right. They took the tags off right as to who it belonged to you know there's no tags on that no i mean like when you travel somewhere you have a tag with your name on it not in the 1800s <sighs> maybe all right. The following Sunday, so about a week later, six days later, John Church, this guy that was going to buy the furniture, gives his final appraisal, which was $340, which in that time in 1879 was a little over $12,000 for all the furniture in the house, minus the two chairs that she was going to give to her friend and porter. John Church gets at the house and he hires a few movers to move all this furniture. It was a, a couple days worth of furniture and obviously there wasn't any cars they did say a van back in in that time so they did have the word van and i did look it up it was this was before henry ford but there were cars in 1879 which is crazy but there, there were not like cars that you think there were basically buggies mm. with you know they probably have two horsepower or whatever but technically you could put a lot of you may show you what i'm talking about yeah okay because when i think i mean i think cars that in that time period i think the model t which wasn't around then all right so this is what the cars would be like back in the days because this confused me too because i was like well they don't have cars so oh, it's kind of okay. like this uh this is oh, an 18, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. 1879 car so i mean wow that's like a downton abbey type thing yeah yeah 
So, but they considered it in the newspaper in 1879. I, I saw the word van, so they actually had a word for van. I'm not sure exactly what type of car it was because they didn't say, but it just said van. So I'm thinking of something with more space in the back. Kind of crazy to go in. Because honestly, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't even. I, maybe this was it. I didn't even think there were cars that old you know yeah but probably something like this i would imagine put mm. the furniture in so it's going to take a few days to to yeah. take the furniture i mean that looks more like a horse-drawn carriage than than like the tin lizzie did yeah which would, that's that's probably a more primitive model of the car anyway yeah so it's going to take a couple days to move this furniture the movers get there and the first day they notice some some weird things the the next door neighbor marches over they're moving furniture marches over and knocks on the door and they can't actually hear what is going down but there's some arguing going on kate then storms out of the house Kate Webster, past the loaders, not even saying a word. Now, this is from the paper. Quote, they agreed the incident was certainly odd and agreed to that they would feel better about the situation if they touched no more of the furniture until its vendor got back. So they came back each day that week and Kate Webster never showed up. In fact, hmm. John Church had already paid her the $340, the $12,000, and Kate Webster is just gone. She never showed back up at her estate. Hmm. Okay. Later that week, it takes about a week, John Church, the buyer of the furniture, gets really worried about his business transaction. He goes to the estate and the, the usual maid that is always there lets him in. And there is a Miss Ivy's. Now, this woman has a story to tell. Quote, this is what she says. I don't know where my daughter is. My daughter, who is away, owns this house. I think my daughter stepped over there. Now, she's an invalid. She's actually talking about her daughter and not Kate Webster, which is a completely different person. She's talking about her daughter that owns the estate, whose name is Julia Martha Thomas. But this lady, the mother, is an invalid, and she says, I don't know where my daughter is, yada, yada, yada. So they didn't know that that wasn't Kate Webster mother they figured it out pretty quick church then looked in one of kate's personal bags and found a note postmarked february 26th that began with the title dear julia so it's seeming like to me the real owner of the house may be this julia the mother says her daughter's name is julia she doesn't know this kate webster and there's a letter in kate webster's personal belongings that say dear julia okay you guys have any questions not yet. Mm -mm. But who is this Julia? Surely it can't be Kate Webster. John Church and Ann Porter, her old roommate and, and their family, they rushed to where the letter was postmarked and they gr were greeted by the sender. The sender says, Kate Webster, why, that's the girl that Julia wrote me that she's taking on as a maid. So oh. Kate Webster is the maid of Julia. Okay, this is confusing. But they didn't get along and Kate was giving her notice. All right, so where are we at now? They go to the sender of this letter uh -huh. that they found in Julia's pocket. Right. Who is Kate Webster? Oh, I know who Kate Webster is. Julia, the elegant, the rich, the socialite Julia with all of her, all of her elegance who could hire all these maids, hired this girl named Kate. This is some poor Irish woman. Wait a minute. So Kate Webster took the identity of Julia and moved into the city, into the second home? Quote, apparent from it was the fact that the tall, youthful Kate Webster had been masquerading since March 4th, at least, as her squat 56-year-old former employer, employer, Julia Martha Thomas. Her motive for doing so, to take and wear her mistress's clothes and jewelry and sell her household goods and pocket the proceeds. Okay, but where is the real Mrs. Thomas? She dead, yo. All right, let me kind of bring everyone back. That estate is actually owned by Julia Thomas. Got it. Okay, do you understand? She is a widow yeah. and she is rich. She hired a Kate Webster, which was just like any other Irish maid she could hire at the time. Right. To work for her. The the friend that had sent her the letter said that they didn't get along. And that's all we know so far. But it's seeming like Kate Webster is masquerading as 
this Julia woman and selling all of her furniture. Mm. So where's Julia? Well, Julia. Uh, uh, uh. The Scotland Yard got involved and got particularly interested in the contents of the travel bag that she gave the man nearby. Remember the man nearby that she was at the mm -hmm. pub and she gave this bag to? Mm -hmm. Robert Porter, the son of Ann Porter, said that he that night helped Kate move her bag and he said, quote, something rolled around inside like a melon. Oh, like a head? Furthermore, Robert declared that later that very night, after he'd seen Kate, part of his assistance to her was the removal of a wooden chest from two vine cottages to the middle of the barn's bridge. When we got there, Kate told me to go back to the house and wait for her. She said she was to meet a man who was going to take the chest. I started back, but when I got to the end of the bridge, I sat down to rest. After a few minutes, I heard a splash and then Kate came strolling along. Let's go back to the house. And remember in John Church is appraising the furniture. What was that that headline that the newsboy threw? Threw at the door. What was the headline on that paper? Head in a bag. Headless body found in a trunk. Oh, I was close. Good job, Jen. <laughs> Jeez. I'm on a roll today. Like that she head. is on a roll. <laughs> Heads will roll. Do off with your head. Do, 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 do. Dance, dance, dance till you're dead. Heads will roll, heads will roll, heads will roll, on the floor, off, off, with the head. It's a good song. Dance, dance, till you're dead. Heads will roll, heads will roll, heads will roll, on the floor. No, don't. <laughs> I think in my head I have perfect pitch, but I'm pretty sure outside of my head I don't. Kate Webster was a fraud. She was masquerading as the woman that she worked for, Miss Julia Martha Thomas. She says, quote, there was nothing I could do for the poor lady, so I decided to cut up the body and get rid of it. Oh. I know that it was wrong, but I thought it was the only way to stop the blame being laid on me. Here's what happened. Let's go back to what happened. This story started like this. Kate Webster shows up with all this elegant dress. She says she's met this new man. In reality, Kate Webster was a maid. And she was. She was an Irish maid. But she was an Irish maid for this Julia Martha Thomas, who was kind of a tyrant from what everyone else said, a tyrant. She was hot-tempered. She was more of a recluse than anything else. She hired Kate Webster, and they just argued all the time. She's arguing with her maid. She decides to give her the notice. So I guess even in London back in 1879, you couldn't just fire someone. You had to give them a notice. Mm. And when she did that, she actually invited more boarders to stay with her because she was so afraid that Kate would do something. She was so afraid that Kate would result to physical violence. On Sunday, March 2nd, Miss Thomas went to church and said, When I come back, I expect to find that you have gone. But Miss Thomas was never seen again. She's never come back. The neighbors that kept coming over there kept asking about Miss Thomas and Kate Webster would make excuses. Miss Thomas has gone to stay with her sister in the country. She asked me to stay on and look after the house until her return. Two days later, the neighbors asked again and they were surprised to see that Kate Webster was actually wearing Miss Thomas's clothes. Mm. Let me show you a picture of her. You guys can get a picture of good old Kate Webster. So, and I told you she was Irish. Right. Already, but this is her right here. Oh, dark eyes. Dark eyes. Now, she actually has 36. She doesn't look Irish. Well, she is Irish. Well, she, I, I know, but like you, when you think of an Irish person, you think well, of... Well, you think drunk? She no, doesn't look drunk? That's not what I said. I said... <laughs> She doesn't look Irish. She she doesn't have light eyes or light hair. She's not fighting anyone. Well, yeah, some Irish people do have dark <laughs> hair, Christ. but most of them Our most gingers. of them do have light hair and light gingers. eyes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but that's the, also Scottish too. The absence of a soul is what you're trying to say. That's not what I said. <laughs> that's not what I said. I just said she doesn't look no. really Irish. That's all I said. So there's a story I'm doing for Dan Darren about a woman named Mary that I'll probably do next week. That's also Bloody Irish. Mary? Yes, Jen, Bloody Mary. That is also Irish that... Mary Queen of Scots? That is correct again, Jen. Yes, you were correct. 
So that is what she looks like. Um, two days later, neighbors came and asked again about Mrs. Thomas's whereabouts. And they were surprised that Kate was actually wearing her clothes. She had already donned the dress and began masquerading as this Julia Thomas. Now, what do you think her excuse would be when she finally gets caught of why she was wearing the clothes? Because they were nice and she couldn't afford it. She said, quote, it would keep them aired out. <laughs> As opposed to what? Keeping them in a closet? The murder happened after church that March 2nd. Mrs. Thomas, the house owner, comes home and there was a fight on the second floor. An argument like all the others. Kate Webster hasn't left yet. Julia Thomas expected her to be gone. There was a fight. Kate pushed her down the stairs and then she started beating her until she passed away. She didn't know what to do with the body and she's in the house all alone. She takes the body to the kitchen. She starts cutting up the body. She places the body parts in that that trunk that was found in the River Thames. Now, one thing about the trunk that was found in the River Thames is the, the police, when they actually brought out the body parts, they said that it appeared that these body parts have been boiled. So Kate Webster cut up the body and boiled each body part. I'm guessing that she thought in her mind that the skin would just evaporate and she would be gone forever. But that's not how it works. So they found the body parts boiled inside the bag. Now, the question is, where's the head? There was no head. If you remember the article, it said a headless body was found in the River Thames, but there's no head. No one has ever found the head. Mm. She says, upon the mistress's return from church, she went upstairs. I went after her and we quarreled. I threw her from the top of the stairs to the ground floor. I lost all control of myself, caught her by the throat, and in the struggle, she was choked. And that is when she dismembered the body after that. So the, the question is, where is the head? Do you remember at the pub when the, the youngest porter, 15 years old, said that it seemed like there was a melon in this bag? Yeah. And Kate Webster said that she was going to meet this man. Yeah. This random man. Mm -hmm. And with this bag. Well, apparently there was no man. Oh. No one has ever found the head no one knows where the head is still to this day in 2022 cut up and boiled to feed street children horrific fate of victorian murder victim whose skull was found in david attenborough's garden what <laughs> So this is 2011. The skull, 135 years later, was found when David Attenborough was doing construction on his home. And this is the skull right here. That is the house owner, Julia Thomas's skull, that they could never find. How do we know? Because it's the same house. They found the... That's where, that's where so he lives. So he, he lives in her former house. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Full circle, bitches. <laughs> Wow. So she he lives he lives in that house. And you know what's really crazy, Jen? What? You know what's really crazy, Jen? Tell me. Jen, I want to tell you something fucking Go ahead. crazy. <laughs> tell me. Look at this shit. You won't believe it. You ain't gonna believe this shit. Who? What do you notice about the house? <laughs> There's construction going on. <laughs> this is when they found the head. Really? <laughs> when Google went by the fucking thing. <laughs> wow. Whoops. <laughs> Damn. And you can actually see the man. I think he's actually looking at the head. I'm not sure. That <laughs> kind of crazy, eh? Shit. Man, that yeah. is crazy. Shit goes full circle. <laughs> ah, fuck. So imagine I if he like narrated a story about this <laughs> crime. And this is someone who's just learning who David Attenborough is. But like, if he is such a famous, narr famous narrator. He is, Jen. You, you've heard, you've yeah. seen nature doc. He does nature documentaries, but he does them all. The most famous one. And he's been doing them for fucking 60 years. I know you've heard, like in high school, you've, you've heard his voice. Maybe. What do you mean maybe, Jen? I'm just saying, I can't confirm or deny. He does have a very distinctive voice from what you shared earlier, but I don't remember anything. Ugh. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Wow. Uh, 
that wasn't my favorite. Lauren says that he's been knighted. So, Sir David Attenborough. Oh, sorry. True. How do I get knighted? Well, you have to be British. No, you don't. Yes, you, you have do. To be British? No, no, you don't. Can no, someone she, confirm she might for be me? Right. No. You have to be British to be knighted by the Queen. So you have to have been not, born in in England. Not so, you, so or automatically Scotland we're not or any to other. Oh yeah, you have to. You, you have, have to, to be born in a, in a place that is controlled by British rule. Control. Old. This is motherfucking America, so Jen. Not Brittany be said you have to be able to pronounce horror, so keep going. <laughs> I hope you guys like that story. This is Talk Murray Podcast. My name is John. I'm sitting here with Jen and Nicole, and we put out stories every Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people.